faith community leaders on both sides of the conversation think about Roe v. Wade being overturned. Good morning. It's Monday, and we're live in Studio 5. I'm Jamie Jackson in this morning for Melissa Ross, and you're listening to First Coast Connect. Thanks so much for tuning in. Just ahead, the summer travel season is underway, and flying for sure has changed in a way that we haven't seen before. Have you flown lately? Well, we're going to talk about all the challenges that you could see at the airport, not only here in Jacks, but across the nation. But first this hour, the new era of Dobbs as Roe v. Wade is overturned. For decades, pro-life groups have rallied for the overturning of Roe v. Wade, many likening the procedure to murder. Well, pro-life groups largely consist of evangelical Christians and Catholic groups who say that life begins at conception. Now, pro-life groups cheered outside of the Supreme Court as that decision was handed down. Now, following SCOTUS's decision, pro-choice groups across Jacksonville gathered to protest. So we want to know what your thoughts are. As always, I want you as a part of the conversation. Give me a call, 549-2937. That's 549-2937. You can also hit me up on social media, on the Twitter, as the young people call it, at Jamie Radio News. That's J-A-M-I-E, Radio News. And also you can make sure that you join in the conversation on our Facebook page. Well, we have a ton of guests with us this morning to have a conversation, and that's what today's about. You know, we have seen a lot of arguments. We've seen a lot of debate, whether it be on social media or clashes with police on the news. That's not going to happen today. We're going to have a conversation, and I'm so thrilled to have my guests this morning on both sides of the debate First, I'd like to introduce Pastor Heath Lambert, pastor of First Baptist Church here in Jacksonville. Good morning. Good morning. We also have Reverend Sarah Locke of Jacksonville Campus Ministry. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Also in studio with us is Dr. Bernadette Williams with Household of Faith Church here in Jacksonville. Good morning, Dr. Williams. Good morning. We also have Anthony Bass, pastor of Endurance Church and former safety for the Minnesota Vikings. Good morning, Anthony. Good morning, everyone. And we have Dr. Parvez Ahmed, board member of Interfaith Center of Northeast Florida and writer on the American Muslim Perspective. Good morning. Good morning. And we also have Reverend Adam Anderson of South Jacksonville Presbyterian Church. Good morning. Good morning, Jamie. All right. Hopefully I got everybody. I didn't forget anybody, right? Okay. <laughs> Um, again, we want you to join in the conversation. Give us a call at 549-2937. That's 549-2937. Dr. Williams, I want to start with you. You yes. did something extremely brave. We saw you on News for Jax doing an interview. You shared your personal story of why you decided not to have an abortion at yes. a very young age. For our listeners, please tell us your journey and your story. Well... As I was downtown and I saw them gathering the news people, I went over mm -hmm. and I listened to what they had said because Planned Parenthood had, had called the press. Um, and so afterwards, uh, one of my members went over and told my story. So my story is at the age of 17, um, first time having sex, I found myself pregnant. Um, and then I was sick. I was very sick. I actually, um, my uh, uh, diabetes had went up and I went into a coma. Uh, so um, they found out it was because I was pregnant. So it's about six weeks. And so the, the doctors had told my mom that it, you know, it was threatening my life. And so an insurance company say, well, they would pay for it. And my parents said, um, well, um, if you want to get an abortion, you can, but we don't believe in that. I thank God for my belief and I thank God for the support that I had. So I made a decision that I would not abort the child. But later on, I did have a miscarriage. So I, I feel like this um, overturning of uh, uh, Roe versus Wade would uh, set up a lot of discussion and we need to talk about it. We need to talk about it and hear other people's stories of why they did not do it or why they did it. So that's my story. Absolutely. And Reverend Sarah, I want to talk with you. How did you handle the news of Roe v. Wade being overturned? 
Well, um, I heard pretty quickly that there would be people gathering um, at uh, the courthouse. And so I joined with um, my students and with other people from the university who and with my family. Um, I have two kids and um, I want them to know that they have bodily autonomy. It's something that we talk about as a family um, pretty regularly about consent um, and so we gathered and um, we were there to support the people who were protesting the decision. All right. And Anthony Bass, who's joining us uh, via live from Air with Airlink. Anthony, uh, how did you handle the news with your congregation this Sunday? This obviously being the first Sunday since the decision was handed down. Sure. Yeah. So primarily the main people who discuss this uh, new development in our country was actually the, our prayer team. And uh, we meet regularly praying every day and everybody was excited yet apprehensive because even though Roe versus Wade was overturned, it doesn't mean that people's hearts are changed. It doesn't mean that people have put their faith in in God. And so we're, we're taking a wait and see approach because now the states have, you know, the, the decision-making power regarding what they're going to decide moving forward. But as far as our congregation, we have a lot of people in our congregation who are excited, but we also have people in our congregation who are a bit sad. And so as a pastor of people who have a variety of faith of um, political beliefs, I try to minister to everybody. But as a pro-life advocate, I'm, I'm grateful um, that our country seems to be heading in the right direction. All right, Reverend Adam of South Jacksonville Presbyterian Church. How did you handle the news with your congregation on Sunday? Yeah, we actually had conversation when the leak came out over a month ago. Mm -hmm. uh, we thought it was important that as a congregation of, of people who are in the community that we understand and we're thinking critically about what is our country, what are we as a community uh, doing in terms of how we care for each other. And so we spent some time that Sunday after the leak came out, we talked about our denomination, the Presbyterian Church USA stance on reproductive rights. Uh, we have thought more about what does it mean to be in action to care for folks around sexual rights and reproductive rights altogether. On Sunday, we prayed. Uh, on Sunday, there was there were a couple comments. Uh, the scripture that I used on Sunday was the Good Samaritan. So there were some comments related to uh, faith and how it engages our uh, the decisions that are made around us. But I think primarily we had done our work over a month ago, and so now it was affirmed. Uh, the decision was affirmed on Sunday. So now we're saying, okay, what are we going to do next after that in terms of action? And to follow up, what do you all plan to to do to follow up? What What is your plan for the future? Yeah, so uh, one of the things that I think is, is difficult when decisions like this happen, uh, of course, the federal decision, but then also it sounds like the state is going to take a similar tact uh, in terms of reproductive rights, is that it makes these decisions that individuals will wrestle with and struggle with, and it forces them underground. It forces them to not be able to be open so that a community can wrap their arms around one another and walk through that. We need to decide how we're going to continue to love and care for folks, uh, irrespective of what the, the country or the state is going to do. So that has taken a couple approaches. One that I think we're looking at in particular is we're saying, well, what is it like to have comprehensive sex education that isn't abstinence only? that is offered to the entire community and to parents to help them navigate well. If some of the issues that that lead us to this decision is making sure that everybody understands what it is to, to get in that position, sexual health, reproductive rights, then we should be at the forefront of that. We should be an institution that says it is not just abstinence, but it, but it is all of life that is important. And so how do we help people uh, value their sexuality? So that's part of what we're going to do. And you are listening to First Coast Connect right here on WJCT News 89.9. I'm Jamie Jackson in this morning for Melissa Ross. Pastor Heath, I want to check in with you now. Um, obviously, for your church, First Baptist Church, yesterday was a day of celebration. It was. Yeah, talk about that and help our listeners understand why and how you all plan to move forward with this new era. Sure. So when I read the decision on Friday, I wept for the justice and the good sense of the decision. 
very thankful for it. We did make a decision at First Baptist to change our order of service, and so we spent uh, the first 30 or 40 minutes of our morning worship service on Sunday uh, praising God uh, for uh, the goodness of this decision. It was a remarkable moment as I stood in front of my congregation and I said, the era of Roe is over, and a couple of thousand people stood to their feet uh, in tearful applause. Uh, so we were we praised the Lord for the goodness of the decision, and we also uh, made a, a recommitment. It's not a new commitment for people at our church, but it's a recommitment uh, to care for the survivors of the abortion culture that we're living in. There are so many victims, uh, women and children, uh, who are potential victims and real victims, and we want to care for those women and for those babies with uh, counseling, with care with support, with financial support, with uh, adoption and foster care. And so it was a celebration, but it was also a recommitment to uh, care for the many families who are victims and potential victims of the, of the atrocity of abortion. And to follow up on that, why is it important to have that particular focus? Because, uh, so abortion exists one of the one of the great things about the opinion is that it is just a it's a legal opinion that says this this is a matter of fact is not in the constitution it's not in our legal tradition that's the legal piece um, abortion so abortion is against law it is against science because we know that uh, the fertilization of an egg is the creation of new life, and it is an immoral and a wicked and a corrupt act that is against God's law who forms human life in the womb. And so uh, a person of good sense, a person who cares about the law, a person who cares about science, and a person who cares about morality uh, must work against abortion and must work as an exercise in loving care uh, to provide care for people who have been victims and potential victims. So we want to we want to say the truth and we want to say that truth in love and in grace and in care uh, for everybody who's been harmed by uh, by the wickedness of abortion. And again, we want you to join in the conversation. You can give us a call at 549-2937. That's 549-2937. We're going to be heading to the phones in just a minute, but I also want to check in with Dr. Ahmed. Dr. Ahmed, your thoughts on the Roe v. Wade decision. Like all of the speakers before me, it's um, the decision is um, a, a great transformation for our society. Uh, we wake, wake, woke up on Friday morning uh, where all Americans had certain rights, particularly women had certain rights, but after 10 o'clock, uh, women lost those rights. So it's the first time in perhaps in American history where a right that the society was used to was taken away from them. So as a person who has advocated for the due rights of all citizens in this country, uh, particularly as a religious minority uh, who ha whose community, whose faith community was victimized post 9-11, um, I felt a great deal of sadness uh, that um, so many people have just lost a fundamental right that they were used to. Now, from my own faith perspective and um, from my uh, conversations with people in my faith community, um, it is quick to, I quickly realized that there is a multiplicity of view on abortion in my faith community as it is in perhaps many other faith communities. The Muslim perspective on abortion is actually quite nuanced and quite varied. But the, 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 the bulk of the opinion, the consensus of the opinion, is that abortion should be legal and available at least until 120 days, um, the first 120 days. Um, so suddenly to find that abortion in certain states where there are large Muslim communities uh, could be restricted or become unavailable would be a violation of the religious liberty of uh, many Muslims. So I think the, um, the challenge going forward in this post row world will be now government is essentially interfering in the religious liberty of people, in the Jewish community, in the Muslim community, 
the understanding about what is permissible um, for abortion is very different than it is in, let's say, evangelical Christian communities. Um, and now we we are we have set ourselves as a society where there is a clash um, in 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 essentially the state interfering in the religious liberty of communities. And we're going to go to the phones now. We're going to go to Daryl in St. Augustine. Daryl, welcome to the conversation. Uh, good morning. Thank you. Um, I apologize if I say this wrong, but according to uh, NBC's The News this morning, uh, 49% of abortions in America are performed on uh, poor women, uh, black girls, black women um, living in poverty. I'm just wondering with your guests there, uh, what are the social, economic, and demographic uh, implications of an explosion in children um, in poverty? One thing for certain, the Republican Party is not going to provide any more economic services it seems like this is going to be really put a terrible burden on on the mothers, the children, and everybody else. Um, just curious of what you think this is going to have on a long-term basis. All right, Daryl, thank you so much. Um, Sarah, I'm going to have you respond to that. I mean, a lot of people are, are saying from a political standpoint, at least, um, what happens next because, and, and I do think this is an interesting um, argument that uh, some people say, well, politically people are, you know, against abortion, but what about the lives of people who find themselves in that position? What's going to be done to care for people um, to not even get into the position of, of having to have a decision like that? What are your thoughts? Sure. Um, so the the folks that I work with most in my ministry are um, young people, um, people who are in college and young adults throughout Jacksonville. And I think that what we're going to see is that the people who are most affected by this decision are going to be people who already have um, unequitable access to health care. Um, it's going to be queer people. It's going to be trans people. It's going to be um, young people, people who are already economically struggling. Um, our students are going to see an adverse effect because of this. Um, and it's it's going to be our most vulnerable populations um, of every kind that are going to um, be most affected by this decision. And um the fact of the matter is, is, is middle class, upper class white women such as myself, they, we will probably be okay um, being able to travel or um, being able to find access to care and, and have the health care that we need um, in these situations. It's going to be the people who are already in the more vulnerable situations that are going to be even more affected. And what are your thoughts on the fact that men are part of the conversation, not just in, in this room, but in, in general, having an opinion and having your vote or having a vote? What, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think men sh absolutely should have an opinion. Um, the, the bottom line is this is about bodily autonomy um, and that I, I believe that I have a son and a daughter, and I believe that my son deserves to have bodily autonomy just as much as my daughter deserves to have bodily autonomy. And, um, and so it affects not only women, but it also affects men. Um, and I think that we are going to see that in the next um, several years. All right, we're gonna go back to the phones. We're gonna hear from Javon. Good morning, Javon, and welcome to the conversation. Good morning. I think there really is, um, for the pro-life movement, there really needs to be an adequate answer for um, the hypocrisy that exists in um, not supporting things that actually prevent abortions from being needed, like universal health care, like good education, like better access to jobs, like holistic community development, that uh, if they had spent the last 50 years fighting the need for abortion versus fighting the access for abortion, 
there would be an infrastructure to prevent many millions more babies from being aborted. But now we have a, a, a situation where they have tied themselves to a political party that behaves immorally, but they have taken a, but they believe that this issue is a moral stance. So I think I would I would really like to hear how those who are pro life answer for the fact that they they are not doing things to prevent abortions that um, at least not in scale to the work that has gone into fighting Roe versus Wade. And also that the party that has brought them this victory is also a party that has denied, you know, millions of Americans access to basic health care and better education. Like there's a real uh, cognitive dissonance between being pro-life and not actually protecting, you know, living people. Gotcha. Thank you so much, Siobhan, for that. And obviously making some some points that again a lot of people are asking anthony bass with endurance church i want to check in with you and get your response to that criticism um obviously not from the political standpoint but your response to what javon had to share no i think his argument is valid um there's a movement out there it's called the whole life movement that you care for the individual we should care for the individual from the womb to the tomb right and that but but if we're aborting people before they're even having a chance to engage life then then we don't even have to have that argument because those people are gone so let, let me make this point there was a book i read or, or in early probably about nine, uh, 2015 it was called freakonomics and in the book they made an argument that the reason why crime rates dropped in new york in the 1990s was because in the 1970s people were having abortions and so the, the answer, according to these statistics or these economical uh, scientists was, you know, if we eliminate people, then there won't be crime. To me, I was horrified, right? Like we have to have that discussion. We have to advocate. We have to use policies that enable people to have a great quality of life. But ending life before it's even born because of challenges or struggles, that's the wrong, that's the wrong answer. Think about uh, slavery. I mean, how many people would have ended their lives, I mean, if if they had the opportunity because of the horrors that they were going through. Personally, um, I was born um, before my parents were, were married. If, if they had that choice then, which I think they they could have, rationally speaking, they, they could say, we'll eliminate this young man so we can have a good quality of life. I think moving forward now, we have the conversation regarding what life is. I think we now have a conversation moving forward, like how do we provide access to conditions that, that in a sense, don't uh, in a sense hinder someone from having a good quality of life. We need to rethink what it means to care for our own. We, we need to rethink when we talk about what a, a ministry should be, how do we care for people once they are in a difficult situation? Human beings don't give up on life or people just because the conditions are hard. That's what makes us unique. And I think if we decide to end life before they even have an opportunity to figure out who they can be, I think we're doing a disservice to God who we're creating his image. And we're also just doing a disservice to that person without even giving them a choice to live their life. And you're listening to First Coast Connect right here on WJCT News 89.9. I'm Jamie Jackson in this morning for Melissa Ross. We're going to go back to the phones. We're going to go to Joseph in Jacksonville. Good morning, Joseph, and welcome to the conversation. Good morning, Jamie. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. And and tell us your thoughts. Uh, I think for the evangelical Christian to start at any point other than uh, Psalm 139 would be a disservice. Uh, If you try to make legislations or form opinions on anything other than Scripture, uh, you are usurping God's authority uh, when he says that uh, he formed you and knitted you together in your mother's womb. Even before we were created, before our parents saw us for the first time, God knew all of our days and had them numbered before we were even a thought in our parents' mind. Uh, So I believe for the Christian specifically, you must start with that. Uh, Obviously there are cases and there are exceptions that would be very compelling to uh, murdering a child, but you could make exceptions and uh, find cases that would make it compelling to commit all kinds of atrocities and disobey the Bible. Uh, But to, dictate and uh, interpret God's law based off of exceptions is not only a 
a disservice to you and a misrepresentation to the Bible, but it's also misleading and pulling people away from Christ. So my encouragement to all the evangelical Christians listening would be to take politics out of it, start with Scripture. Um, if God does form life, which was his idea, and he sustains it for the length of time that he chooses to sustain it, then you accept that, you praise it, you thank him for it because you are a product of that design, um, and you assist the people that are struggling with this decision, show them the beauty of Christ and his redemption, uh, the beauty of his salvation and his fellowship uh, that he wants to have with them, and then you put uh, feet to your message and you support those women if they are going to keep the baby you support them if they need to give them up you give them a good home mm -hmm. uh, but i think starting with scripture you support and honor christ with how he decides to make and sustain life uh, and you praise him and spread his message thank you joseph for calling in and i want to remind people because we're getting some tweets and we're getting some social media comments this is a conversation and we are here to talk we're not here to fight. We're not here to argue. People have different views in this country. People have different views in this world. And every voice is being heard. Every opinion and thought is being heard. So I just want to share that. And, and to our callers as well, I appreciate you calling in and being part of what I've been calling it, a conversation. Um, obviously, Joseph from Jacksonville had a, a lot to unpack there. Pastor Heath, your response to Joseph. Yeah, I think uh, Joseph's fundamentally correct. The it, What he's putting his finger on is the real heart of this issue. And the real heart of the issue is what is life? When does it begin? What is the contents of the womb? Issues of bodily autonomy and all the rest are downstream from that. Because if we can show, as we can biblically, as we can scientifically, uh, that from fertilization we have the creation of a new human life, then that human life is very weak and in need of protection. And so the issue isn't, uh, first and foremost, the bodily autonomy of uh, the woman uh, or of the uh, man that is the father, the, the issue is how do we protect someone who is very weak? I'm Look, I'm a Christian. Uh, I am a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And what that means is we have to figure out what is godly and what God does when he looks at weak people who are guilty of sin and in trouble. He sends his son Jesus to live a perfect life and to die on the cross and to rise from the grave. That is, he He gives of himself. He loves people. He sacrifices himself. It is, it is foreign to the universe created by the God of love for people to look at weak folks and say, uh, we're going to harm them. We're going to eliminate them. We need to seek to be like God and uh, love that which needs protection, not, not condemn it to death. And Dr. Ahmed, people are comparing the decision to Taliban law. Uh, why do you feel that that judgment is problematic? Well, as I mentioned, uh, let me first uh, preface that by saying that um, we believe in the freedom of religion in this country, freedom of all religion. Um, what Pastor Heath was talking about and the caller was talking about was a perspective uh, from, a, from a very uh, evangelical Christian perspective. That perspective is not shared by all people in this country. From an Islamic perspective, uh, and, I, and to your specific question, Jamie, about why the comparison with Taliban is problematic, because Islamic law does not view abortion the way we just heard either from Pastor Heath or from the caller or certainly the Supreme Court decision. The Islamic perspective, the, the consensus in Islamic law about abortion is that it is legal at least until 120 days, almost on demand. After 120 days, it is conditional based on the health of the mother. Um, and the health of the mother comes first under almost all circumstances. Um, but as we look at the Supreme Court decision and its impact statewide, in many states, particularly in Georgia, in our neighboring state, for example, 
uh, abortion would be illegal under all circumstances, which means that would contravene the religious liberty of people who are of the Islamic faith, people who are Jewish, people who have a different understanding of Christianity um, than evangelical Christians do. Um, so here again, um, we have a situation where not only is the, uh, the Supreme Court decision a violation of the individual autonomy of women and the agency we women have, it is also a violation of equal protection for all religious communities because all religious communities do not subscribe to the view that life begins at conception. Um, the Islamic perspective is that there are four stages of creation uh, in the mother's womb. Um, and after the, in the fourth stage of the creation, which is after 120 days, does the flesh that is inside the womb gets converted into a life that is a soul, that is a human life, that's a soul, uh, that has a soul in it. So different religions have different ways in which they approach the question of when does life begin? It is there is no universal consensus on the question of when does life begin? Um, and, and religious communities uh, uh, view that very differently. Um, and now we are being asked to subscribe to a universal view on that, which is an infringement on the religious liberty of other people. All right, we're going to go to Herman on the north side. Good morning, Herman. Good morning, Jamie. Thank you for the conversation. Uh, no disrespect to any of the other guests. 40-year uh, broadcaster, um, I guess probably 60 years old, and 40 years in and out as a Christian raised Pentecostal in Jacksonville, Florida. I want to commend Bernadette Williams for reactivating, renewing my faith in the faith base or the Christian community, especially in Jacksonville. I think that we missed the ball with what's now known as the pandemic slash the jab vaccine. I think that this ruling, ruling is politicized and it does not address the real issue. The real issue what is, yeah, is I was gonna say, what, family your thoughts? and sex out of wedlock. Mm -hmm. And when you fix family and sex out of wedlock, you fix abortion. And as I land the plane, lastly, if Bernadette Williams can give her testimony, which is really the nation needs to repent, as a man 60 years old, black man 60 years old, uh, I want to repent for driving the getaway car. And what do I mean by driving the getaway car? I did not have the abortion, but the lady who wanted to protect me wanted to have the abortion and protect her career. I said nothing but just drove the getaway car and allowed her to go inside and have the abortion. So in the sight of my God, I think that's wrong. And I repent, and then Bernadette Williams can give her testimony. Thank you, Bernadette, for being a woman in God's church and preaching the gospel and letting me know I need to step up. Thank you so much, Herman. A lot there, uh, Dr. Williams, your, your response to, to Herman on the North Side. Well, as I said, um, that was the same year that they, in 1973, when I found myself pregnant, when they passed uh, Roe versus Wade. And um, like I said, uh, starting college and being pregnant, um, being taught a certain way, you know, uh, being brought up as a Christian, I, I chose not to, you know, not to do the abortion. But later, uh, I did have a miscarriage, but I did not do the the abortion. Um, I've talked with women. Uh, I am a licensed clinical pastoral counselor too. I do feel like we need teaching and training, like we talked about in provision, providing help. We need to provide help. We need to be able to listen to the stories, listen to why, and not condemn, N not condemn, not judge, and then go from there. People need to know have somewhere to go. So we teach them because a lot of times you can't use abortion as um, your way of 
not, you know, just not having a child. When I made a decision that I wanted to stop having children, I got my tubes tied. <laughs> I did not make a, you know, say I didn't want to have kids and then do something about it. So I do feel like education, training, a place to come if they need counseling, providing more health care, whatever's needed, other than just using abortion as that way of using it politically. So thank you. You know, that that's my way of thinking. And Reverend yeah. Adam, <laughs> are, are there people in your congregation that, disagree with your point of view? Well, sure. I mean, that's, that hopefully is the gift of a community that is, that is trying to together figure out um, what it is to live faithfully is that we'll disagree. And I want to make mention of this because as I've, as I've listened, one of the things I want to say is I think it's important that I also am a Christian and I'm also a minister of the gospel. And you know, I have some stark disagreements about some of what's been said, um, namely that all of the conversation that we've had up to this point could still happen if Roe versus Wade was the legal precedent, right? If the Supreme Court had made a different decision, this conversation still could have occurred. I can still have disagreements in my congregation. When that doesn't happen, right, when the decision came forward and if things continue as they look like in Florida and in other states, now we can't have a diversity of opinions because now the diversity of opinion moving forward is criminalized, right? So if I am somebody who believes in being pro-choice, if I am going to caretake for somebody who believes that in the whole bevy of options, the best option is to proceed to have an abortion, well, now that could be criminalized. And so what does that mean for us as, as uh, pastoral care providers? What does it mean as a community that cares about justice? And I will tell you what is so hard for me, and one of the callers really hit on this, is that we so rarely, when we talk about this conversation, so Sister Joan Chittister, who's a, who's a Catholic nun, says, you know, we tend to be more pro-birth than we are pro-life. Because what we don't talk about is the care of the mother afterwards. We don't talk about postnatal care. So oftentimes when I have folks who disagree with me, kind of coming back around to your question, Jamie, you know, one of the things I'll do is say, let's not hit on the thing that we could tweet, right? If our, if our deeply held frustration about something could be summarized in 200 and some characters, then it's insufficient for the nuances yeah. and complexities of life. So instead... What is it like to deal with all of the complexities of life? And so, you know, I will struggle to ever celebrate this decision that was handed down because it is only going to make my life harder to love and care for people. Uh, it's a pirate victory at best for the church. And in, in moving forward, I mean, how do you continue to have this conversation moving forward now that we are where we are? I mean, give WJCT credit. Uh, this is part of it. And I totally agree with Bernadette. I think one of the things is to tell our stories. You know, when, when I hear of families who make this decision one way or the other, we need to hear those stories and we need to trust the fact that a God who is faithful to every single person is in every single story. There is redemption in every single story. There is hope in every single story. And it does not and that there is no shame, there is no judgment, there is no, um, there is no condemnation for people who make those decisions. So at least I want to say for whatever time I get to be on the airwaves is like South Jacksonville Presbyterian Church will be a place that one will not feel shame, no matter the decision that they made, because we need to hear those stories and we need to walk with people. So tomorrow and the day after, Jamie, I'm going to do the same thing I've always done, which is love people, care for them, hear their stories and where I can be helpful to have God's commonwealth move forward, I will absolutely do it. And we do want to note, Rabbi Barry Silver of South Florida recently sued for infringement of religious freedom because Judaism commands women to choose their own life over fetuses. He is going to be a guest on First Coast Connect later this week, so we want to add that in. Uh, Pastor Heath, I, I want to dive into moving forward. Um, you mentioned that as a church, you all have made a decision to focus more on preventative measures, on caring for women, on, on caring for children. Um, how do you respond to the argument that we've heard several times this morning, which is, you know, where was all of this stuff before this decision and what is going to be done 
even more so to protect women and to protect babies. Yeah, well, I think first of all, that's a that's a very important question. I think on the way to answering it, I think we need to tell the truth about what the Supreme Court decision said. If you read the decision, which is, it's a lengthy opinion, but it's not a hard read. Uh, it's very, very clear what they decided. Actually, they, they have taken no rights away. They reversed the decision of Roe versus Wade and said that the Constitution does not contain uh, a right to an abortion. And what they said is, now we're returning this issue to the people. There was a, there was a judicial fiat, what Justice White called uh, the exercise of raw judicial power. And they said, we're going back on that and we're going to let the people. So what the Supreme Court did for everybody who wants to have a conversation, uh, Dobbs versus Jackson says, have the conversation get together and pass a law, get together and, and get on the same page. So it's actually an encouragement to freedom rather than a judicial overreach and an imposition of one perspective. We get to have the conversation more freely now today than we did before. It's not There's nothing religious in it at all. Uh, it's just it's a pure legal opinion that returns the power back to the people and back to the states. Um, what we want to use that freedom to do at First Baptist is is nothing new. I, I would say for, I'm not a member of I'm not a representative of a political party. I'm not a political hack. I am a, a Christian man who leads a body of believers. And I would say that before Friday, we spent about 98 percent of our time on the issue of abortion, caring for women and caring for babies, and about two percent of our time uh, engaged in any kind of practice that would be legal or political. Uh, most of our effort is in caring for women, helping them make decisions that are wise and honorable and consistent with the Word of God, caring for men and helping them make those kinds of decisions, encouraging adoption and uh, foster care. Um, all of the all of that work, which has been again ninety eight percent of our effort, uh, all of that will continue today with a lot more freedom to do it because of what the Supreme Court said. And I want to give our last sixty seconds, a little more than sixty seconds, to Sarah. Um, obviously, again, we're talking about a conversation. How do we continue to have this conversation with people on both sides? moving forward because there are differing opinions here there are differing views this is a conversation but how do we continue to do that sure thank you jamie um i think ultimately um what i am called to do as a pastor in this community is make sure that people know that god loves them god adores them and um, that there are communities and networks and pastors and religious leaders that um, also adore them and will be a part of the networks that allow them to make these difficult decisions and um, and that God loves people who have abortions, whether it is a difficult decision for them or whether it is an easy decision for them. God loves people who have abortions. And um, and myself as a pastor, I also love people who have abortions. And if that is the only thing that people hear this morning, I hope that that is what they hear. Um, because that to me is the most important thing that can come out of these conversations is that God loves people. Well, this is definitely a conversation that's going to continue in the future to come. And I want to thank each and every one of my guests for being a part of this conversation and for it being done respectfully, yes. because this conversation can happen respectfully and it should. That's right. So I'm going to name everybody by that's name. Great. We've got a lot of folks. So Pastor Heath Lambert of First Baptist Church, thank you so much for joining us. Mm -hmm. Thanks Reverend, for having me. Reverend Sarah Locke of Jacksville Campus Ministries, thank you so much. Thank you. Dr. Bernadette Williams with Household of Faith, thank you so much. And thank you for sharing thank your you. story. Thank you. We also want to thank Reverend Adam Anderson of South Jacksonville Presbyterian Church. Thank you, Jamie. Thanks for joining us this morning. And Dr. Parvez Ahmed, board member for Interfaith Center of Northeast Florida. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jamie. And thank you, Anthony Bass of Endurance Church. Thank you, Jamie Jackson. We'll be right back. I'm Carol Hills. Chaotic summer travel in Europe. First it was COVID, then a shortage of workers. Now labor strikes are hobbling transportation across the continent. Next time on The World, we head to Spain, where a workers' strike could ground a major airline and punch a hole in Spain's tourism industry. Our story from Barcelona on The World. This afternoon at 3, here on WJCT News 89.9. 
I'm Anthony Brooks. We trust women. We won't go back. Protesters outside the Supreme Court reacting to the decision overturning the constitutional right to an abortion conferred almost 50 years ago by Roe v. Wade. We'll explore the implications of the decision. That's next time on Here and Now. Tomorrow at 1 on WJCT News 89.9. On the next Fresh Air, comedian, actor, and writer Joel Kim Booster. He wrote and stars in the romantic comedy Fire Island, now streaming on Hulu. He has a new comedy special on Netflix called Psychosexual, and he co-stars with Maya Rudolph in the new Apple TV Plus series Loot. Join us. Today at noon on WJCT News 89.9. The Supreme Court has overturned Roe v. Wade, eliminating the constitutional right to abortion. We explore what this ruling means for women's health, and we hear from you. I feel that my daughter is now going to grow up in the level of rights of America that my grandmother grew up in. Next time on 1A, America in a post-Roe world. Today, starting at 10 on WJCT News 89.9. Today's segment of First Coast Success is brought to you by First Horizon. And welcome back to First Coast Connect. I'm Jamie Jackson, right here on WJCT News 89.9. Logistics is a growing sector in Jacksonville, and the shipping industry is a huge part of it. Have you heard of logistics? Well, Trailer Bridge CEO Mitch Lacano speaks with Karen Brune Mathis of the Jacks Daily Record in today's First Coast Success. Mitch Luciano is CEO of Jacksonville-based Trailer Bridge Incorporated, which has been in business 31 years and expects $350 million in revenue this year. The reason for that figure? Logistics. Mitch Luciano, welcome to First Coast Success. Thank you so much for having me. Let's start with you telling us what Trailer Bridge is and what it does. Trailer Bridge is an asset-based uh, transportation and logistics company, uh, mainly servicing uh, Puerto Rico and the Dominican Republic. But over the last uh, few years, we've expanded tremendously in the United States and, and has expanded into domestic transportation and also North American trans transportation. Well, why do you expect to reach the $350 million in revenue this year? What's driving that? It all started when the pandemic started. The, a lot of companies took a step back, not knowing what was going to happen. We decided to take a step forward and took a lot of chances, a lot of risks. And those risks are starting to pay off now. And they started paying off last year. And we're really seeing it take off here in 2022. So we're super excited about it. Now, when you say risk, what do you mean? Uh, instead of laying people off, we were hiring people. Um, it, was, it was weird. In June and July of 2020, we're, we're hiring people as we hear our competitors are not. And we took that opportunity to bring on some really, really special people. Because our whole business is based around who works at Trailer Bridge, not really what Trailer Bridge does. And it was a great opportunity to capture some pretty talented, fun-loving people, and it's it's turned into an amazing place to work. Well, talk about the start of Trailer Bridge here, and that was 1991, I believe. What Correct. was the vision? Trailer Bridge was started by a gentleman by the name of Malcolm McLean. He was the fatherhood of containerization as we know it today. He created the containers on a vessel um, uh, process. And when he decided that he wanted to move trailers to Puerto Rico, so 53-foot trailers, which was unheard of at that time, he created the company with the vision of, hey, we can domesticate this trade lane even though it's going over water instead of it treating like an international trade lane. And that was his original vision, and it just expanded over time where to the point, you know, they got the opportunity to go public one day and, um, and just kept growing and, and built a lot of respect on the island of Puerto Rico. Now, when we talk about containers, what, what goes into the containers? What are on those barges? What are on the ships that we're seeing? It's funny you ask that because we always tell people that we're not in the sexiest business in the world. And, but what we do for people uh, in Puerto Rico, the Dominican here in the United States, is we deliver you know, food product to their brand new car that they've been waiting for for months. We don't get to see the end result, but we know we have a very special place in what we're doing for society and our culture. And so that's, when our people think about what we do, we're like, you don't see them receive it, but we're doing a lot of special things. And, and you know, 
putting dinners on people's tables uh, to the new cars I talked about to products to build a brand new house. It's pretty exciting when you when you think of it that way. Now, Jacksonville is a big logistics center. A hundred percent. It's it's one of the biggest. Define logistics. Define logistics. Uh, logistics is the process of, of moving goods from raw material, the farm, uh, to the table. And everything that goes in between that, whether it's the packaging, the processing, um, the movement of those goods, the, the timeliness of the movement of those goods. And so it, it's, it is one of the staples to our society and economic um, position it, is, is logistics and transportation. It's critical to our everyday life. And Jacksonville has, of course, the port yep. and, uh, of course, the access to the ocean, the interstate system, the rail service. That's what makes Jacksonville so amazing in logistics. It's, it has everything, and it can get to anywhere pretty quickly. When you have 95 and I-10 uh, for the for the highways, uh, two railroads that are servicing this city, and, or three railroads that are servicing this city, and then, and then having the ocean piece, it just brings a lot together. And the, and the growth we've seen in the distribution and warehousing side has been amazing. We had a lot of opportunity to build out this this. Uh, logistics center and you know the community has come together and we've all worked together to really create that well you came on board in, i believe 2012 correct and that was after trailer bridge had emerged from bankruptcy reorganization you became ceo in 2015 how did you define and then carry out your vision for the company the number one thing we talked about was the people of trailer bridge um, the focus was making sure that they had a place they wanted to go work at you know, we didn't. We don't want them to wake up in the morning. And go, oh, I've got to go to work today. We wanted to wake up in the morning. And go, yes, I get to go to work today. And so, the, it was 100% taking care of them. And then I knew if we took care of the people of Trailer Bridge, they would take care of our customers. And then we get the positive results we've seen. Thank you for joining First Coast Success. Thank you, Karen, for having me. I appreciate it. And of course, I want to make reference to our earlier conversation. You know, it takes a lot of bravery, a lot of bravery to have that conversation. And I certainly appreciate everyone, everyone who shared in on social media, our in-studio guests, and those who called in as well. Let's keep the conversation going, and let's make sure that it's a respectful one. Well, that's going to do it for our show this morning. This has been First Coast Connect on WJCT News 89.9. Our senior producer is Heather Schatz. Catherine Hobbs is our associate producer. Our director is Josh Torres. Our production intern is Marie Billow. Jessica Palumbo is our editorial director, and our news director is Randy Roguski. Of course, if you have questions or comments about the First Coast, make sure you send us an email, firstcoastconnect at wjct.org. As I always love to say, thanks for the company and make it a positive day. Support for First Coast Connect is provided by Baptist Health and the North Florida TPO. Baptist Health is a proud...